it's been interesting um, this whole month talking about misfits. You know, he's talked about different men in the Bible. And uh, I was sharing with my friend about what our series was, and I said the word misfit. She said, you know what you can do is break the word down, and you can have miss and fit. And what that means is, what happens is, you miss fitting into someone's expectation. Like, you're probably expecting John today, and obviously I'm not. And um, it was just a good analogy to me. You know, what was the misfit? Like, expectations are me showing up. It was just a good word there. The word misfit, I love to look the words up and see where they come from because I think there's always a good deep root there. And it came from like in the 1820s when we just couldn't go to Target and buy our clothes. We actually had to go to a tailor if we wanted something fancy probably that our mom couldn't make. And we would go get fitted and go get sized and the tailor would have us come back in. Well, if the clothes didn't fit... It was a misfit. Something with the measuring or something with us had changed and had not lined up to fit each other. Something was off as far as like the calculation. So we have to adjust to that. And now it has become to mean a person who doesn't fit into our expectations as well. You know, a person that doesn't fit into the environment around them. Have you ever felt that or seen that or known that? You know, they just don't fit into what's going on around them. So, when John shared with us, you guys, about misfits, I loved the four things that he shared the most each Sunday. And what did he say about misfits? God saves misfits. He heals misfits. (laughs) Look at y'all. He uses misfits, and he forgives misfits. Let's don't ever, ever forget that. Because I don't know about y'all, but I was sharing in the first service, I kind of grew up feeling like a misfit, like I didn't belong, like just a big old mess up. Um, I wasn't in with the cool crowd. I really wasn't cool enough. I wasn't in with the bad crowd because I wasn't really rebel enough, although I had a little bit in me, uh, but not a ton, (laughs) not enough, you know, to be out there. And it just always felt like I wasn't comfortable in my own skin until I finally, finally got it that I am who he says I am, you guys, and that I am not a misfit, that I am worthy. And I think when we can finally get that and let him use that, it's really when we can lean in. And so I'm super passionate about sharing that with everybody else once I got it, how important it is for us to walk in that and to really know that and to really um, stand in that and believe it. Because when I started researching and writing and looking up stuff, I realized that Jesus was actually a misfit, right? Does that surprise anyone? Like, somebody actually brought it up to me. You know, we were expecting him to come in on a big horse, looking like a king with the trumpets blaring, you know, the gold and the fancy clothes. And he was not. And we expected the guys, the people that when he came, they expected him to be there to reinforce their laws, you know, and tell everybody this is how it really is. And he didn't. He was born outside, He was born plain and simple, and it was just kind of like he kind of came in on a donkey. It wasn't anything fancy. It was just so not what everybody was expecting. It really appeared that he didn't fit to be our king when he came. So Pastor John and I were talking about who he wanted to talk about and who I wanted to talk about. He picked the guys, of course, and I picked a lady, and actually I went and found some more ladies, so we got four women we're going to talk about this morning. But I think no matter what, men or women or whatever in the Bible, we can all relate to these stories. There's so many stories in the Bible where God uses misfits. So the first one I want to talk about is Esther. She's always the one us women think about first when we're thinking about somebody that really changed the world for the kingdom. And there's so much in scripture there. So she ended up being a beautiful Jewish orphan. And somehow she found herself to be the queen of a Persian king. So none of that really fit. But the previous queen, through some foolishness, found herself without a spot. And so she came and filled that spot. Listen to this in Esther 3, 8, in the message version. And Haman is the one speaking, y'all. Haman is 
um, the king's second in command, kind of like his right-hand person. And he says about the Jews, because Esther was Jewish, there is an offset of people scattered through the provinces of your kingdom that don't fit in. He's telling this to the king. Their customs and ways are different from those of everybody else. Sounds like a big misfit to me, right? The Jewish people. So Haman, the right-hand man, he was kind of mad because Mordecai, who had raised Esther, he was her uncle, would not bow down to him when he came in, when he was around. He wouldn't bow down, and he was all miffed about it. So he went to the king and said, uh, King, uh, what I'd like to do is to kill these Jewish people. And the king gave him permission, which sounds so crazy to me. So Esther heard about it. She knew she was Jewish. They hadn't even asked her. They didn't know she was Jewish. They hadn't asked her the question. She was like, in this place for such a time as this is what we always hear about. So... She had to risk her life to go and speak to the king because without an invitation, she risked her life to walk in and speak to him. But she did it, you guys. She stood up. She did it. She talked to the king. He changed everything around. They weren't going to kill the Jewish people, and her people were saved. So no matter how scared she was or how misfit she felt, she stood up. She walked in. She talked to the king, and she saved her people. Her name... Esther means star. She was definitely the star of this story, for sure. And I know without a doubt that God can use our stories, my story and your story. God used this misfit. And God, point number one is, do not underestimate how God will use you no matter where you are, no matter where you find yourself in a weird situation. You're like, Lord, I don't know how you're going to get me out of this or how are you going to show up? I cannot see it. But he sees it and he can use us and he can do this. The next person I want to talk about, y'all, is Gomer. Do y'all know who Gomer is in the Bible? Yeah, that the ladies do. The ladies are like, yeah, I know who Gomer is. There is an amazing book called Redeeming Love. If you haven't read it, guys and girls, even my son read it. It is such a good book. It's just about this love story. So, Gomer. All right, she was the adulterous wife of Hosea the prophet. Y'all, Hosea is so important. He had his own book in the Bible, right? But when it came time to get married, here's how it goes. Hosea 1-2. When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her. And I think we can feel sure that Hosea was like, um, Did I hear you right? This is who you're choosing for me, you know? And But I'm sure he knew the Lord was up to something and he was looking for a misfit. So here's this prophet. It's time to pick a wife. And he says, choose this promiscuous woman. I'm sure he took a double take for sure. And I'm sure Gomer probably felt like she was not the person for the job. You must be looking for somebody else. Like, don't you know I'm this woman that has gone from man to man to man, and I have done nothing to deserve to be Hosea's wife? Don't you know? And so... They got married, and what kept happening is Gomer kept leaving, and she kept running back to her old life and running back to her old ways. And what did Hosea do? He went and got her. Every time he went and got her, every time he pursued her, every time he went after her. One time he even had to pay money to get her back, like real good money to get her back, but nothing was too much. He kept going to get her. She was going back to her old life. Do you know that Gomer, her name means complete? And so what I take that to mean is perhaps God used this misfit, used Gomer, to show us his complete love for us, right? Like how completely he loves us, how in him our our salvation is perfectly complete. And he will never, ever stop pursuing us. He will never stop coming after us. There is no price too large. No matter what, he is going to fork out the money to pay for us. Gomer shows us that we are complete in him. He forgave her not one time, not two times, 
not three times. He forgave her over and over and over. And I do not doubt, you guys, that God can forgive us. God forgives misfits, right? So point number two is we cannot outrun our Father's forgiveness. Because I don't know about you, but I've tried, right? Running over here, going back to this, trying all these things to outrun what he has for me. And no matter what, he woos me back and he calls me back. And he forgives wherever I have been and whatever I have done. There is nothing that he is not going to forgive us of. The third one that I want to talk about was the woman who touched Jesus' garment. Have you heard about her? He was out in a crowd, and I'm going to read to you guys. It is Luke 8, 43 through 48. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, and no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me, Jesus asked, like he doesn't know, right? When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know the power has gone out of me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. This woman, you guys, had been bleeding for 12 years. That is a long, long time. And she couldn't even get her name in the Bible. She's just the woman, right? It's crazy. She walked around in her daily life just hemorrhaging. She had been to every doctor. She had tried everything, doctors, doctors. You know, and even according to the law, she was not even supposed to be out. She wasn't even supposed to be in this crowd. She kind of just snuck out. She was unclean. Can you imagine? She had been in quarantine for 12 years. And we are so over it after 12 weeks, right? I mean, I am, you know. I'm sure she was weak. I'm sure she was desperate and weary, and that's what provoked her to do this, you know. The part on his garment that she touched is a tassel, and they say it's a tassel that represents wings through the law. And y'all, it is healing in his wings, and perhaps she knew that. I never even realized that. Perhaps she knew if I can just get to that tassel, if I could just get to the healing in his wings, maybe I could be healed, right? Because instantly the blood stopped. She took a huge risk with her little misfit self, and the blood stopped. She was saved. But did she have to touch that little tassel part? You know, probably not. But I think the Lord recognized what she was doing, recognized her faith, and he healed her. You guys, God heals misfits. Do we believe it? He really does. He says he does, and I believe it. We can have faith, you guys. This is point three, that an encounter with Jesus will transform us, right? Like, we will not go away the same. Like, I hope today when we walk in these doors and we sit together and we worship together that we will never leave the same. Like, I come in here to be transformed, and that should be our goal. Like, an encounter with Him will transform us if we will just let Him, right? Misfit or not, right? Lastly, I want to talk about the woman that was to be stoned. Do you all remember her? Still an unnamed woman, but she was to be stoned. And what was she caught in the middle of? Right. So Jesus, I'm going to read you guys from John 8, 1 through 11. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. And at dawn he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him. And he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. And they made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery in the law of Moses. The law of Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now what do you say? They were using this question, you guys, to trap, to trap Jesus. 
And they wanted to accuse him as well. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. He was sitting and he was writing in the sand. And when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone. Would we have been first? I wouldn't think I would be. Again, he stooped and wrote on the ground. And at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left, with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said, then neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. Y'all, they caught her in the act of adultery. Who knows what she looked like? Like she might have still not had any clothes on. She might have just been thrown like something around her to kind of cover her up. But she was right here in front of all these people. I mean, talk about a misfit. You know, this was an intimate act reserved for marriage and the law and all of that. And she was to be stoned. That was the rules of the day. And it sounds kind of like a cruel way to die. When I started looking at it, I'm like, I can imagine what it would take to kill someone by stoning them, right? Because if you ever had like a stone pop up on your windshield like I just did this week and make that little splatter in your windshield, I mean, it's kind of like, you know, jolting. It's kind of traumatic. And so they start throwing the stones and you get bruises and then it starts breaking your bones and then it starts causing internal damage, So it must take a lot of stones to actually kill someone. I'm just thinking of all that he actually, he saved her from, what he did for her. Because you actually die from blunt trauma. But Jesus, y'all, he took this story and he turned it around. So who would cast the first stone? Both of those, it was Jesus and this woman, both of them were taking a huge risk here. You know, and he just turned this story around. He didn't stand there and shake his finger at her and remind her of all that she had done. He just loved her. And, you know, I heard this cool analogy why Jesus writes in the sand, and I loved it. It's because Jesus is constantly writing our story and rewriting our story. So it's written in sand because it's just a constant work of art in that sand. So he saved her. God saves misfits, right? Amen. Point number four is Jesus writes our story and uses it to save us. So we're probably right in the middle of him writing our story, right? Or towards the end or at the beginning. And we can't see what the big picture looks like in the story, but he can see that big picture. And he's using everything. There is nothing going to waste in this story that he cannot use, that he won't use. And sometimes we can look back at that story and go, oh my gosh, that's why that happened, or that's why he did this. But we just have to trust that he is writing the bigger picture and the bigger story. Jesus writes our story and uses it to save us. Come on, Dad. I know I said, don't get too comfortable back there. I don't talk as long as John does, but he's coming back. It's good. So I wanted to remind you guys, God uses misfits, he heals misfits, he saves misfits, he forgives misfits. And these are just a few stories, guys. There are so many in the Bible, so many stories of how God used people and how he's going to continue to use us. But what it reminded me of and the big take-home thing that I got from going in and reading about this is that he does not leave us as a misfit. He takes us, he takes that misfit, and he can change it, and he changes our story. So even though I might have felt like a misfit, he does not leave me there. And I'm going to read a couple of scriptures to encourage you guys. And it's 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, All things have become new. So he takes our misfit selves. He makes us fit. He makes the garment fit. He does the alterations and the adjustment. He changes whatever needs to be adjusted. He renames us and he uses us and our story. That's not just me. That's us and our stories. We are in him. He is in us. We dwell in each other, right? 
We cannot be separated. Nothing can separate us from each other. We are together. Isaiah 43, 18, 19 says, Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Paul says, Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? He's in us, guys. James 4, 5, do you think Scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? So today can be that day for all of us where we can stand in these truths. He literally and he practically lives inside of us. We can't get him out. He is in us as believers. And I want to share with you guys some of the names that I found in the Bible that He, the Lord of the universe, uses to describe us. And I want you to listen and maybe pick one or two that you can use for yourself that are personal for you. Here we go. Here's a rundown. He says we are new, God's child, a friend, accepted, chosen, redeemed, one with the Lord, beloved, justified, united with Him, free, hidden, confident, secure, God's temple, seated with Christ, God's workmanship. He says we belong. He changes our name and He takes our misfit selves and He makes us new. He gives us His name. And you know what His name is? I am. And I am is doing a new thing in all of us if we would just let Him. There is no limit to what He can do. I want you guys to stand up. The band can come on down. Y'all can quit eating donuts out there. Because we're going to stand up, guys. And what, what, what can we do? We can declare that we are saved, we are forgiven, we are healed, we are used. We can say, I am Esther, I am Gomer, I am the woman with the issue of blood, I am the woman who was stoned, I am David, I am Paul, I am Gideon, I am who God says I am. We are who He says we are, guys. We are a whole kingdom of misfit who God uses. He makes us new and He changes us for His glory. Amen. So I-